Hi guys, White Witch 110 here. I would like to welcome two new members to the family. Crazy Shepherd and Mary Tid Bits from the Attic. Welcome. And I would like to start off this evening by giving some information as to why we do certain things or why we get certain things such as kitchen witch dolls. They ensure the cooking is good. They are also good luck to all who enter the kitchen. It is a German and Scandinavian tradition. Also, removing shoes before entering a home shows respect for the home, leaving your worries and problems outside. Your mudroom is an example. You are leaving the matters of outside separate from inside your home. And removing one's hat is also a show of respect and the place. Britain and Europe, the first and last stalks of wheat, were woven together in shapes. They were kept in a place of honor to assure a good crop next year. Also, corn husks were used. The dolls were either buried when planting in the spring and all in the field. They were also burned as an offering to the harvest deities. Dolls can also be placed in your compost piles. Now, focus in Latin means center point or fireplace. And fireplaces back in the day were used for soap making, candle making, dyeing fabric and cooking, very much the center of the home, much more than just for heat and much more than just for romance. Don't know why that one was there, but okay, let's get on to it. Now, to anyone who isn't familiar, this is the CN Tower in Toronto, Ontario. My hometown. I could actually see this from my bedroom. And I also watched lightning strike it from there as well. It stands 1,815.3 feet from the bottom to the antenna spire at the top. Con it's a concrete communication and observation tower, as well as a restaurant. It was built on former railway land of the Canadian National Railway, thus its name. Okay. Sorry about that, just getting self-situated. This is a picture when they were building it. The tower was completed in 1976. <clears throat> Construction began in 1973, and it opened June 26, 1976. The cost was $63 million. And in 2018, it would have cost $270 million to make. The, the height is equal to 147 stories. It has nine elevators. The tower held the world's tallest building for 32 years until 2007. It is now the ninth tallest freestanding in the world. Now it remains the Western Hemisphere's tallest freestanding. In 1995, it was declared one of the modern seven wonders of the world by the American Society of Civil Engineers. The tower is a member of the World Federation of Great Towers. And this is the Toronto waterfront back then when they were still building it. It is an icon of the Toronto skyline along with the Rogers Centre, better known to most of us in Toronto 
as the Sky Dome. The original concept began in 1968. CN Railway wanted to build a, commu a communication tower. They also wanted to demonstrate Canadian industry. It became an official project in 1972. The tower can be seen 25 miles away from the, to the north, 37 miles to the east, and 30 miles to the south. Original plan was for three pillars linked by structural bridges. As plans continue, the tower you see today evolved. Construction began on February 6, 1973 with the massive evac excavation of the site. 56,000 tons of earth and shale were removed. The depth, 49.2 feet in the center. 450 tons of rebar. <clears throat> Sorry about that. 36 tons of steel cable and 22.0 feet thick. Four months for the foundation to be ready for the building and a hydraulic oh my throat hang on a hydraulic slip form was made it was unprecedented engineering this was to help them with the pouring of the concrete 52,972 cubic yards of concrete can withstand winds of 260 miles per hour 75 times a year, the tower is struck by lightning. The glass floor in the tower is two and a half inches inch thick panels, and they are four by 50. Can you imagine standing on top of that? Not me. No, no, no. And this is part of the construction crew. And this is something that's damn scary. And my cousin did this. Some other interesting facts. Three eight inch scuff plate replaced annually. Two and a half inch tempered glass laminated together. One inch layer of air for insulation. This is talking about the glass that you can walk on. Test, test loads are performed annually to, sure, to ensure the public's safety. The glass, let's see, there's a picture of it here. Let's see. Um, there it is. That's what you can walk on. No, I never did. It was installed June 26, 1994. Can you imagine standing on that? They have guts. I, I would not be able to do that. Okay. Now you can edge walk on the CN Tower. First of its kind in North America. World's first freehand walking on a five foot ledge. You are 116 floors above the ground. If you so choose to be brave enough, it costs $195 plus tax. And with this, you receive a certificate, a video, a photo, tickets for the lookout, which is valid for two days. You have access to the glass floor and the sky pod. The walk is 30 minutes. You are harnessed to the building and given a red jumpsuit to wear, which you can see here. Okay. Where? There's another one. There. I think that's more likely just a rendition of what it was, but you still get the main idea. So that is about the CN Tower. Now here's a photo of it. 
And there's the Sky Dome or Roger Center. And this is the view from the restaurant. I have been in the restaurant quite a number of years ago. I believe I was maybe 18 or 19 when I went there. And I don't know if it still does, but it used to revolve. This part here would revolve. Okay, let me see. There's one of the workers. You have to have no fear. That is for sure. There's another photo. Now they do have lights that change color on here at Christmas, but they'll put the red and the green and so forth. And that's a look at the restaurant more than likely while they were building. And that's it. Okay, 140 years ago, on this very day, the Black Donnellys were murdered. Blessings on their souls. James, Joanna, and James Jr. arrived in Canada from Ireland in 1842. They found a piece of land and made a home. Unfortunately, they did not know that the land was already owned. The owner was not willing to pay the Donnellys for all that they had done. A dispute occurred between James Sr. and Pat Farrell. This was during a barn raising. James killed Farrell and served a seven-year term. There were eight children, and Joanna left to them, left, let me read that again. There were eight children, and Joanna left to fend for themselves until James was released in 1865. By now, most of the neighbors were not on good terms with them. James served his time at Kingston Penitentiary. Conditions there only hardened him further. Any neighbor who said or got him upset, he became quickly violent. In 1880, vigilance broke into the Donnelly home. They murdered James Sr., Joanna, two of their sons, and a niece. Then they set the home on fire. Their son William lived away from home. He returned to the property in 1881. He rebuilt over the footprint of the original home. Five horse chestnut seedlings were planted in honor of the dead, of the dead family members. Only two of the trees remain. In 1988, Rob, Linda, and their son Charles bought the home. They were made aware that it had belonged to the Black Donnellys, and Rob wrote a book called You Are Never Alone. While unloading their boxes into a barn, they felt they were being watched. Each trip in, the feeling grew stronger. Son Charles seen a man and woman dressed in black in his bedroom. Rob had also seen them. One time, Rob was taking a shower. Sure someone was there, he pulled the curtain back to find no one. Linda experienced unpleasant feelings in the kitchen, which is located in the 1881 part of the house. The salts had a priest bless the house. Afterwards, the heavy feeling seemed to ease. The Salts give tours now. On one occasion, a group waiting said they seen people moving around the property. Rob informed them they had witnessed the ghosts. He did not have staff. 
One smoke detector is without batteries, but it will beep between 1 and 6 a.m. The Salt family have heard their names being called when checking. No one has called out. An outbuilding on the property had emitted the sound of sawing on occasion when Linda had passed it. The building was locked and she was the only one home. The couple had heard a crashing sound in the winter and summer. There is no reason for it. Also, there is never a vibration. They have heard the front door open and footsteps on the stairs. Tools and other supplies are known to temporarily go missing. Lights and switches are played with and their dog and their dog refuses to use either staircase in the house. One psychic from A and E claimed claimed to have detected a female she felt was the only daughter Jenny. Other psychics have seen James Senior and Johanna. The salts impart their knowledge and enjoy having visitors from around the world learn the history. They were called the Black. They were called the Black Donnellys because people thought their hearts were evil. And these were looks like they were pictures that he that Robert used. Such a horrible way for part of a family. And that would be the original homestead. And that is the original tombstone. There you go. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about tonight is the Peterborough Lip Flocks in Peterborough. They were opened in 1904 and are a National Historic Site. The lock is the 21st on the Trent Severn Seaway. It is 43 meters length and 10 meters width. Boats are raised 65 feet in the air. It was the largest hydraulic lift in the world. Now one spirit is that of a, form, a former worker by the name of Arthur. He passed away of a heart attack on site. People believe he continues to work at a place he enjoyed. They always say hello and goodbye to him. One paranormal investigator heard footsteps on the stairs, and when she turned, no one was there. The same investigator had heard whistling in the tunnels. Temperatures will drop by 10 degrees when the spirit is there. Is there. Local legend has it one construction worker is entombed in the lock. The story says he fell into the middle pillar the story has never been confirmed, so I imagine that's in here. One worker was 70 feet down in the tunnel. He was waiting for the elevator. When he turned round, he found a pair of hip waders standing straight up. Pushing the boots aside, he confronted his co-workers later. They had no idea what he was talking about. Going back down, he attempted to make them stand up again, but he couldn't. I believe these are all... Whoops. No, it won't let me. These are all kayaks. 
and canoes in there. Considered the most haunted spot in Peterborough, the canals of the Trent Severn were begun in the 1890s. R. B. Rogers was the engineer. In 1903, one of the painters died jumping from unstable scaffolding. He jumped opposite the other two and fell 60 feet. This was by the middle pillar. A psychic said, there was a death, there was death all around. People have taken their lives, not only from the lips. Unusual experiences occur at least once a week. When checking reports of footsteps, they are clearly found and they're wet. Workers on the locks do their work between midnight and 5 a.m. These are when the prints are noticed and they go to the middle pillar. Many pieces of equipment that are used in regards to maintaining the locks are original from the construction of it. One wrench, in fact, is very difficult to lift because it's heavy, but workers have actually reported seeing it go flying off the table. And some workers have left early because they have been too scared to continue. Now my family and I went there when I was younger and I distinctly remember it because my, my father had gone into the washroom and my uncle had gone just seconds later and if it wasn't for the fact that he had gone in when he did, my father likely would have split his head open because he had passed out due to the heat and my uncle stuck his toe out and that's what my father hit. So I thank God for my uncle's toe. Now last night we left off in this story with the two friends going to watch back video. Now this is the next part. Although there was no answer to my questions, something by the buffet caught our eyes. Over a minute and a half, a mist appeared. There was really no shape to it. Chills began to climb my neck. I could feel the hair standing one by one. My friend turned toward me. He was lost for words. The mist lingered for only a few seconds. It was confirmed I was not alone in my house. Knowing what basic, knowing what basic things I do about the paranormal, I figured there must have been something here before. Checking online, I could only find photos showing a forest. There was never a home here until this one. Needless to say, I abandoned the mousetrap idea. What was going to happen now that the spirit understands I'm aware of it? The basement was my main concern. My hope was I had only one spirit, not two. Taking back my home is the prime step. I still wanted to know who was here. During the night, I was awakened by a rattling noise from the ductwork. What are you doing? I need sleep. I shouted and fell back onto my mattress. I stared at the ceiling as the noise continued. In the morning, I called the repairman for the furnace. It was becoming a normal thing. Nothing was wrong. I had all the ducks clean, but nothing was seriously wrong. The money I was spending made me very upset. Then a thought came to me. Was this spirit assisting me in preventative maintenance? Even that sounded crazy to me. Doesn't there always need, doesn't there always need to be a deep reason for a haunting? Friday, my friend came over. He had information. I explained my past week to him. There was a murder in this area, he said. It dated back to 1905. 
I expressed how sorry I was for the poor woman. He dropped a bombshell. She was the murderer. Oh my God, I'm sharing my house with a murderer? This was unsettling to say the least. If she was capable of that in life, what would she do in death? She had killed a man who had meant to rape her. The story claimed that she had overheard him in the alley with his friends. She had formulated a plan to lure him into the forest. She spoke sweetly to him that night as he knocked on the door. She made promises of delights he had never experienced. The clipping said her clothes were found by his body, but she was nowhere in sight. Others in the house, had others in the house seen her? How many owners had there been? Suddenly, many questions that weren't important were. The house was built in 1980. The original owner was the Gibson family. They lived in the house for 10 years. In 1990, the Morris family moved in. They were here till 1997. The Neals lived in the house for two years, Campbells for three years, the Bouchards one year. From 2003, anyone in the house didn't stay long. It had been empty since 2017. The last person in the house was a tenant by the name of Russell. We would track down as many as we could for answers if they would speak to us. And that's where we'll leave it for tonight. I was going to go on, but no. That's where we'll leave it for tonight. So thank you to my loyals for dropping in. And for the new subscribers, again, welcome. Anybody who's just passing through, please check out my other videos. Give them a thumbs up if you feel to do so. Leave a comment. I do return my comments. Share it out if you think someone else would be interested. Consider subscribing. If you're going to subscribe, hit the notification bell so you'll know when I upload. I hope everyone had a great Tuesday. Tomorrow's Wednesday, hump day. Fabulous. I have a few more haunted places that I've looked at to tell you about tomorrow. I thought it was important to say the information about the Donnellys since it was the anniversary of their deaths. It wasn't a long, drawn-out information, but it was still information. You can go online. There is a website in regards to them where you can probably get more details. So, until tomorrow night, ciao for now.